Okay, we're going to continue the proof of the axe growth and deep theorem via model theory. And I will put a reminder of what that is in just a moment. But the introduction for this lecture uh, starts with the phrase transporting proofs. So this is common practice amongst mathematicians. So the example that we spoke about last time was if I were to prove something uh, about a mathematical object that has a certain level of complexity to it, complexity meaning structure, so that's a much better word. So if I were to prove something about a mathematical object with a certain level of structure, but I don't appeal to the entirety of that structure, then of course that proof also applies to objects without the structure that I did not use inside that um, proof. So a really simple example of this is if I were to consider a ring R, then I might prove for you that the additive identity is unique. That is, it is, there is one and only one additive identity inside the ring R. And on the high level, a proof that I might give is I were to say if there were two of them, then I can just consider the sum of both of them. So say zero and zero prime are both additive identities, then just by using commutativity and also the defining property of the additive identity, then I can indeed show you that zero is equal to zero prime, proving uniqueness. Now, we see that inside this proof, I never used the multiplicative structure of R at any point. So indeed, this holds true in the more, in the more general setting of any abelian group. Now, it holds in even more generality than that, but I think, I think the point is clear because it holds true for any group. But whatever, the abelian assumption there is not offensive and it lets me to uh, teach us simply consider rings, which are familiar mathematical objects. The point though is that we did this very vaguely, no, not very vaguely, just the fact that we have set up all of this formalism of model theory, uh, it gives us the opportunity to try to do this in a more formal setting. And the benefit of doing it in a more formal setting would be that maybe we can find an example of applying this type of proof technique in a non-trivial way, right? So whilst I'm still talking on the high level of introduction, I'm just going to write on the board, never used multiplication. So proof is valid for billion groups. And this implies a proof technique. And so the motivating question is, can we find a non-trivial example of how we could use this proof technique using model theory? And the answer is going to be yes, and we're going to prove the axe growth and deep theorem, which I'll write off on the second board. simply states that any polynomial from Cn to Cn uh, satisfies the property that if it's in 
effective than indeed it is surjective. Okay. Now the way that we're going to do this is we're going to make the observation that the complex numbers C are the algebraic closure of the real numbers. And we're going to consider a similar statement to the X growth indeed, but in the uh, in the context of a algebraically closed field of non-zero characteristic. Uh, the fields of prime characteristic are finite, and we can use that structure in order to prove this theorem more simply. And then we're going to use model theory to transport. Uh, so essentially, we're going to say if we had a disproof of this theorem, then we would be able to take a proof in the um, sense of natural deduction of uh, the negation of the statement and transport it into the first order theory of algebraically closed fields of non zero characteristic and arrive at a contradiction. Okay. So it's time to start getting formal and setting this up properly. So the first thing that I need to do is introduce the first order theories that we're going to be interested in. And what they're going to be are the first order theory of fields. And then we're going to extend them to the first order theory of algebraically closed fields just by adding in some extra uh, axioms to the theory. And then we're going to consider the various different characteristics, characteristic zero or characteristic P, where P is a prime. Okay. So I'm going to let F be the first order theory with one sort, we'll call that A. And then we have a series of function symbols. We've got five of them, zero and one, and there's a zero area. And then we've got the minus function symbol, which picks out the additive inverses. This goes from A to A. And then we have plus, we also have multiplication. This is A cross A to A. I've got some pretty noisy construction outside my window. Can, can anybody hear that or is it? far away enough. Uh, coming through too much. It's not, or it is. Well, I'll assume it's fine. OK. So the axioms are the standard axioms of fields. I'm not going to write out all of them, but I'll give you an idea of what they look like. So we have associativity at the top, and then we also have commutativity of addition. And the fact that additive inverse acts as the additive inverse, et cetera, right? So, the full list uh, is written up in the notes, but I'm going to assume that this is relatively familiar. And maybe the only thing that is slightly non-familiar is writing them out in a first order theory. So maybe you've seen them written up on the blackboard before as, hey okay, everyone, this is what a field is, it is a set along with these operations and they satisfy the following axioms. And when you saw that in your undergraduate class, you were just thinking about some meta-theoretic statement which is hey we've got these things called fields these are this is the classification of them and these are the axioms that they follow whereas here we've been more formal than that i have an actual definition of what an axiom is an axiom is one of the formulas that you put inside your first order theory once you've established the first order language right so there's non there's epsilon effort in translating one into the other but the effort is mental the idea is that this is a formal theory as opposed to just a inform just an informal description of what type of collection of set along with operations constitutes a field okay hopefully that makes sense so the less obvious part is how i talk about uh characteristic and algebraic closure so i'll write that one out i'll write that out properly and I need to move to the next board to do that. Let's 
So one thing which is going to come up more than once inside this big argument uh, over over however many elections it takes is oh yeah. I thought Billy needed to follow the off because I'm not a touch for speaker. Yeah, but yeah, but ah, uh, so you can hear me now. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So the only point that I was making is one thing that's going to come up again and again inside this argument is we really do crucially use the fact that this function is a polynomial. I mean, that's obvious because the statement is just false if it's not a polynomial, but more, but the finiteness of polynomials is what allows us to get any kind of first order statement out of the polynomial, right? So every time I write down F, where F is some polynomial, what I can do is just write out the expansion of a polynomial instead. And that gives me a proper first order statement. So for instance, I'm going to define P sub D where D is some integer greater than or equal to zero to be the following statement, which is first order for all A zero dot 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 for all A D. There exists X such that A D is not equal to zero and A naught plus A one X plus dot 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 plus a sub d minus one x to the d minus one plus a d x to the d is equal to zero, right? And now if you think about it, if I take the first order theory of fields and I add to that theory, the statement p d for all d greater than or equal to zero, then I have the first order theory of algebraically closed fields, right? And it's crucial that polynomials are finite and can be written out in that way for me to be able to express that statement. If, if I wanted to say that all functions have a root or something, I wouldn't be able to do that in first order theory. So, okay. And then so how am I going to do, yeah? So polynomials don't actually have a formal status within this theory. They just sort of somehow the ambient things that create these uh, statements. That's a good question. So, yeah, if you if you were to write out all the glory deta details of this inside, for, so if you were to write out the full proof tree of what we're going to consider, then you don't see f and you don't see the the definition of polynomial anywhere you just see these big linear combinations all over the place makes sense yeah because the, the only okay. theory can and then of the L field uh i didn't hear that sorry the only thing that the theory can discuss is the elements of the field yeah exactly so the variables, right? So when you take an interpretation of this, they're going to end up being elements of the field inside some particular model. But the only thing that the language can talk about are the variables. But polynomials can be described as a linear combination of variables. That's the way that we always write them down. And so you can just do that inside the first order theory and you have the tools to be able to. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and then I also need to be able to talk about characteristic, right? So I need a first order statement for that, but this one's easy. I'm just going to define SP to be one plus dot 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 plus one is equal to zero, where P is a prime number. And obviously there are P ones here. Okay, and so if I want to say, that I have, uh, sorry, if I want the first order theory of algebraically closed fields of characteristic P, then what I do is I take my first order theory of fields and then I add PD for all D greater than or equal to zero. And then I add SP where P is the characteristic that I'm interested in. Okay. And if I want uh, characteristic zero, 
then what they do is I add the negation of SP for all prime P. Okay, so that's literally what I just said, F and then add PD for all D greater than or equal to zero and SP. And then for, uh, oops, that was meant to be an A. And then for A, C, F, zero, which is the first order theorem of algebraically closed fields for characteristic zero, I take F and I add PD for all D greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, I shouldn't be saying or equal to zero. It's for all D growing up in zero, right? Because what is PD for D equal to zero? I guess that's saying that there is some constant that is both not equal to zero and equal to zero, which is contrary. So I need to get rid of that. Okay, so add PD for all D greater than zero and then add the negation of SP for all prime P. Okay, so both ACFP and ACF0 are first order theories with infinitely many axioms. Now, one detail that will become important later, I'll remind us when we get to that point, but we might just remark for now that although the number of axioms are infinite in both cases, they're countably infinite. So, LF null uh, cardinality worth of axioms here. All clear? Uh -huh. I guess I went a little bit quickly. Okay, but hopefully that's nice and comfortable. Okay, now we can do some math. I'm going to move to the next board and prove the corresponding version of the x and d theorem in the characteristic P case. So here's some algebra. Lemma. So now we're going to consider a polynomial from the finite field characteristic P, algebraically closed, and then n copies of that to itself. And we're going to let this be a polynomial. Hey, what is the overline indicator? Okay. Oh, sorry, that's the algebraic closure. So you take the field of characteristic p, finite field of characteristic p, and then you take the algebraic closure of that. So there's a standard construction for the algebraic closure and it satisfies a universal property, but I'm not going to mention it now because it's not so important. All that we need to understand is that this is a finite field characteristic P and it's algebraically closed. Later, I need to do a technical cardinality argument and the choice of construction or a choice of construction of an algebraic closure from a field itself uh, is going to need to be taken. But I think that's a distraction for now. So I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> yes, I'll be definitely using the Solms <laughs> lemma. Okay, um, so do I have a proper statement here? Yes, if f is injective, then surjective. Uh, and this is not going to be model theoretic or anything, right? I'm literally just going to write out a good old fashioned algebra proof. So let's pick an element inside the target. Y underline is Y1 up to Yn inside Fp bar n. I'm going to find an element that maps onto this. 
is a very slick construction, so I'm going to consider a field extension. How do you spell extension? It's an S, okay. Uh, field extension K, which is greater than FP. So I'm not considering the algebraic closure here. I'm just considering the finite field FP. And I take the field extension, which is generated by the Ys along with the coefficients inside F. Right? So you can think about the fact that FP is embedded inside FP bar. So fields always embed into their algebraic closures. And so I can think about K as the intersection of all of the subfields of FP bar that contain the elements Y1 up to Yn and also all of the coefficients inside my polynomial F. So if you want a hands-on way of thinking about K, you can think about it like that, but there are other ways of thinking about it. Okay, first observation is that this is a um, algebraic extension because all of the generators are algebraic. I mean, I took them from the algebraic closure, so of course they are. And so in particular, we have a finite extension. And the reason why that's important is because that actually implies that K is a finite field, right? So I've taken, I've taken a finite extension of a finite field. So therefore I end up with something finite. And this is the crucial observation, right? Because F is a polynomial, right? So F on N, input only performs additions and multiplications to that input. So in particular, any polynomial maps an element of a subfield to that subfield. So what I'm saying here is that F maps K to K and then injectivity is going to imply injectivity by the fact that K is finite. So lastly, Uh, wait, I wrote that sentence badly. Well, I want to say lastly, fields are closed under polynomial expressions. So can I save this sentence? Uh, there's polynomial expressions. <laughs> Leave fields invariant. It's probably a bad way to put it. Sorry, why did you say that? Did I get something wrong? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, and now look look at this expression, right? So f of k n is a subset of k to the n. K is finite, and f is injective. So the only possibility is that f is surjective. Oh, well, well, okay. The real argument is what that what that really tells us is that f of k to the n is equal to k to the n, but y bar is an element of k to the n. So therefore, there's some element of k to the n that maps onto that via f.
and that's approved. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that argument? Okay, one thing that I'm going to point out about this, because it's going to become a little bit mysterious later on, is we have explicitly appealed to finiteness of FP here, right? And so this is where the non-trivial part of this style of argument comes in. So if we think about my motivating example, when I was proving that the additive identity is unique inside rings, then it was truly irrelevant that I was ever working inside rings. I just went ahead and treated it like an abelian group the entire way. Here, there's a genuine difference. It's not the case that I just might be incidentally working inside the complex numbers here, right? Because they're not a finite field, uh, or rather the real numbers on the finite field. So if I take the algebraic closure, sorry, FP would, uh, sorry, the real numbers would be playing the role of FP here if I were to just run this argument uh, in the original setting and the argument would not hold there, right? So. I'm genuinely using a fact uh, that is true of the finite characteristic case here, which does not hold inside the characteristic zero case. But nonetheless, this entire proof uh, technique works. Okay, let's move over here. I think I underestimated the number of boards you'd need. <laughs> we didn't use a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I don't think I'm going to use the rest of the five, but hey, crazy things have happened. Okay. We can loop back around. So, maybe. yeah. Now we have a corollary, and this corollary is going to sit in between being stronger and weaker than the axe growth and theorem. You'll see what I mean once I write it. So K is going to be an arbitrary algebraically closed field now. F from k to the n to k to the n is, you guessed it, a polynomial. And now I'm going to say, assume that the theories uh, uh, a, c, f, p and a, c, f, zero are complete. And I'll remind you what complete means in just one second. But the statement of the corollary is if f is injective, then it is surjective. Okay, so first let me explain my cryptic comments that I made earlier that this kind of sits in between uh, a stronger and a weaker version of the x growth index theorem. The reason why it's stronger is because we're looking at an arbitrary algebraically closed field here, k, okay? whereas earlier we were looking at the specific one c. And it's weaker because it requires this hypothesis that the two first order theories that I've introduced are complete. Now, what we're going to do is prove this corollary and then later prove that these two theories are complete. So this isn't weaker than the X growth index theorem. In fact, it is just stronger than it. But the way that I've written it at the moment looks like it sits somewhat in between. But the point is, it's easier to understand this way. The point is, if I just allow myself the assumption that ACFP and ACF0 are complete, then we can get a relatively simple proof. And then after that, we do some extra work, which is where the difficult part of the proof lies in weakening uh, those hypotheses, but still remaining with a true sentence. 
Okay, let me remind you what complete means. I think you're gonna forget to say closed formula. Oh uh, yeah. So do we do we need closed formula? Well otherwise yeah. uh basically no theory are complete. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, so every closed formula, um, no free variables apparent in phi. We have either well, let me give a name to my first order theory, T. We have that T entails phi or T entails uh, the negation of phi, which is the notion of proof, right? So either I can prove phi from the axioms of T or I can disprove phi from the axioms of T. Uh, don't get completeness of a first order theory confused with completeness of first order logic itself, which was something that we proved in the first season of Foundations. But since I'm only ever going to be talking about completeness inside the context of a theory that I have in mind, you know, the statement that the theory is complete is a sentence of the form, the theory T is complete. So since I've mentioned a theory in the sentence, there shouldn't be room for confusion. But sometimes that can be a little bit weird. Just be aware that the, the terminology please, is a little bit overloaded. But this is what I mean uh, for the sake of this. Oh, actually, I'm going to use both completenesses. Huh, okay, so yeah, you're going to have to be careful with which one I mean. But this is what I mean for this statement. Okay. So let's let's prove this. And this is going to be the formal version of the rough sketch that I gave at the start of this lecture of transporting the proofs. So this is kind of the interesting part, okay? So and don't fall asleep now. Okay, the important part uh, for the proof is to turn everything that hasn't been um, written in terms of first order statements into first order statements. And then once we've done that, the argument follows quite simply. Okay, and the way that we're going to do that is we're just going to mimic the idea of, so I guess I'm talking loosely again, in quotation marks, for all x, for all y, f of x equaling f of y implies x equals y. That's the statement that f is injective, right? So what I'm going to say is if that holds, then for all y, there exists x such that f of x is equal to y, which is the statement of injectivity, okay? And close quotation marks. So all I'm doing is undressing these definitions and then writing them out as first order statements. And the question as to whether you can do this proof technique in other situations comes down to this. Can you write down what you're doing as first order statements? If you can't, you're stuffed. But if you can, there might be a chance. Okay? Hey, but then don't forget that I can't write it. All right, yeah? Okay, I think you're about to point out what I was about to point out. So the reason why I didn't make it explicit in, in my very first sentence is because I've already done that inside this lecture, right? So yeah, the problem is F. But f is assumed to be a polynomial, so I can expand that out as well. 
That's the reason why I've got quotation marks here. Once I've written F as a polynomial, then that's like not even roughly what I'm going to do. That is literally the first order statement that I'm going to take. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but hang on. Is so does the argument go like like we've started the proof, we've fixed some polynomial f, um, and like all the assumptions of the well, I guess maybe we just fix the polynomial f, and then we construct the statement about that particular f because we can't do it for for like we can't construct the statement of the, of the corollary for any f. We have to choose an f and then make the statement. No, I can do it for arbitrary f in a, in a sense. I can do it for an arbitrary f of, of a particular degree, but then what I just do is at the start of the argument, I meta-theoretically say, let d be an integer greater than zero, and then form the following first-order statement, which is going to be this one, but with f replaced by alpha zero plus alpha one x, or not alpha, a zero is what I used earlier, plus a one x plus dot dot plus a d, x to the d. So there I'm using the fact that the polynomial is of degree d. And then I just replace all instances of f with that inside to the statement. And what that is saying is if you have this collection of variables which organize themselves into this way, but I'm able to read that as, oh, that's a polynomial, which is injective, then I can infer this property, which is to say that it's surjective, and then I can show that that statement is provable inside the first order theory of algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero, and the way that I do that is assume that it's not, and so therefore I have a disproof, and then I transport that disproof into the characteristic P case. That's the step. Uh, is that right? uh, Sorry, go on. So go on, Billy. I was going to say, so you are fixing D, right? I am fixing D, yeah. And I'm, I'm about to make that more precise. Would you let me do the okay. slightly dodgy thing of like, please let me have one extra line and I think everything will be okay. <laughs> I guess I can start the proof proper now. Okay, no, no more intuition. So fix D greater than zero. This is the start of my, this is my first sentence of the proof. Fix D greater than zero, okay? And now uh, consider the statement, and this is a proper first order statement, no quotation marks, no intuition, nothing. This is the raw thing for all a zero dot 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 for all a d. So I'm going to say if I have some polynomial that's injective, and this is a more plus a one x plus dot 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 plus a d x d equals a more plus a one y plus dot 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 plus a d y to the d implies that x is equal to y, then that implies for all y, there exists an x such that y is equal to a naught plus a one x plus dot 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 plus a d x to the d. Making sense? Can I just check that the brackets are like this? Yes. Okay, cool. Cool. Did you have something to say, Eleanor? Or is that okay? Okay, they're feeling shy. That's fine. Uh, do you know this by BD? So, uh, no, no, I'll ask at the end if I'm okay. sure. Okay, go for it. Okay, so. I'm going to donate this, state, this statement BD. I won't even need to go into the guts of it, right? The only reason why I wrote it out so precisely is to absolutely be certain that we're dealing with the first order statement here. But that's all that I needed. So we definitely have, if this is inje if the polynomial is in injective, then it's injective. That statement as a first order statement. Great. Call that PD. Now I'm going to fix a prime. Uh, the first 
So what I'm going to do now is prove that this statement is not provable inside the first order theory of algebraically closed fields of characteristic P for any P. So fix a prime P. Uh, and we have by hypothesis that ACFP is complete. So either ACFP can prove BD or it can disprove it. And if ACFP can disprove it, then this is a contradiction, right? Because for any model I of ACFP, we would by soundness of first order logic end up with some example of a polynomial which is injective but not surjective and that contradicts the lemma that I've already proven. Sorry, could you argue again, how are you using soundness? Just, just read the reason why I need to use, yeah, the reason why I'm using soundness is because I know that models of ACFP exist. And in fact, I know what they are. They are any, they are algebraically closed fields of, of characteristic P. Now, if I, am able to prove inside that first order theory, not BD, then that's not immediately a contradiction because I need to appeal to soundness in order to transfer that proof through the model to end up with some polynomial, which is injective, but not subjective, right? Because the contradiction exists inside the model, not inside the proof system describing the model. Does that make sense? Sorry, what, what, I don't understand what you mean by contradicting, contradiction existing inside the model. So take the lemma that I wrote up earlier of the X growth and theorem inside the characteristic P case, right? That lemma was a statement about polynomials mapping between algebraically closed fields of characteristic P, right? But not in the formal syntactic sense. That's a, that's an algebraic statement. So, so FP there is meant to be understood as a set and the operations are meant to be thought of as a genuine addition function and a genuine multiplication function, etc., not a sort and function symbols, etc. They're genuine sets and functions, right? Yeah. So if, if I merely have a formal disproof, that doesn't mean anything yet. What I then need to do is actually appeal to soundness in order to end up with a contradiction inside the model which is what that earlier lemma was pertaining to. It wasn't pertaining to any form, formal theory or anything. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's actually a good question. I paused on that. I haven't seen that point be made in any of the uh, presentations of this that I found online. I found that I needed to put soundness in. That's the only way that I can actually see how you get a contradiction here. Um, but maybe that's because I'm not using uh, Gödel's completeness theorem or something. But anyway, this is how I've done this. Thus ACFP entails BD. 
Okay. Uh, I don't have much longer left of this argument. So I'll finish this argument and then I'll conclude the talk. If you do want to say more, we did start 15 minutes late, so. Okay, thanks. Need to have need one hour. Okay, nice. Thank you. Okay, so now for the second act of the proof. So we also have that ACF0 is complete. That's also one of the assumptions of the corollary. So either ACF0 can prove BD or ACF0 can disprove BD. And again, I'm going to assume that ACF0 can disprove BD. Then there exists a genuine proof tree disproving to the statement. And now what we do is we appeal to finiteness of proof trees themselves, right? Proof trees are finite. And so in particular, they have finitely many assumptions and it can't be the case that the statement S P that I wrote down earlier, which is that the field has characteristic P, it can't be the case that the negation of that appears in all of the axioms of pi for all prime P, right? That's because there are infinitely many primes. For that to happen, there would require infinitely many assumptions. By finiteness of pi, that can't be true. So therefore there is some prime such that negation S uh, of that prime does not appear amongst the premises of pi. That's the crucial step that allows us to transport this proof into one of ACF P for some P. Okay, so I'll write that out. Okay, so that's the statement that I just said. Since pi is finite, only finitely many axioms of ACF0 appear amongst the premises of pi. So there is some prime Q, such that the negation of SQ does not appear amongst the premises of pi. What that means is that I could work inside a first order theory where SQ is uh, not true is one of the axioms. Okay, so I could work inside a first order theory where SQ is one of the axioms and pi is still a valid proof inside that system. Okay, one such system is ACFQ. That contradicts the first half of this proof. Uh, what was I doing today?
So wait, in the first half of the proof, we actually show okay. ACFP uh, proves BD for all P. So we're just applying that to Q. Yeah, we did. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this contradicts the first half of the proof. And so therefore ACF zero proves BD, right? And now I have to use soundness again. And again, I haven't seen this point explicitly made in other presentations, but I believe it's used, right? Uh, if I just end the proof here and I say ACF zero entails BD, then the only statement that I've made is that this first order theory can prove the first order statement BD. So I've inferred the existence of some proof tree and that's all that I've done at that point. But by soundness, this actually reflects quote unquote truth inside all of the models, right? And that it's, it's inside the models that the x squared and d theorem is uh, pertaining. Okay, that's terrible English, sorry. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is you need to bear in mind the distinction between the first order theories, which are the syntax that we use, and the objects to which the x growth and theorem refers. So using the language of model theory, the x growth and theorem pertains to a particular model of the first order theory of algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero, that is the complex numbers, right? But when I write this, I've only made a statement on the syntactic level. So I actually need to apply soundness in order to refer to the objects that the theorem is actually referring to. Okay, so that proves the corollary. Are there any questions about that? I'm just trying to think about the overall uh, introduction of D and how we resolve that and then yep. how we're arguing it extends to the whole theorem. I think it sort of makes sense. Okay, so yeah, that, that part is meta-theoretic, right? So meta-theoretically, mm. this proof holds for arbitrary D greater than zero, right? So if you want, you can go back to the statement of the corollary and you can change it to uh, let K be an algebraically closed field and let F from Kn to Kn be a degree D polynomial. Uh, assume that ACFP and ACF0 are complete. If F is injective, then it is surjective. And I have proven that statement for all D greater than zero. Now, a polynomial in a single variable has got some degree, and so therefore I've covered all polynomials. And so that's how it extrapolates out to the entire corollary. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, nice. Now, the part that I said earlier, I was going to, oh uh, yeah? Oh, sorry, I was going to ask, you made a big deal about it being crucial that F was a polynomial. Um, is that just mm -hmm. so that you can write down F as a first order expression? Like, Yes. Yeah. That's exactly correct. So if I take right, an so arbitrary no function not the only F. Thing. Right, yeah. So yeah. So polynomials are not the only really thing. I just can't. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. Just, I'll let you say your full question. I'm done. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, earlier, I made this deal about the finite case being finite. Um, it's a little bit weird when you look at this argument. The reason why is because I say here, so I'm on the final board, now, by completeness, ACF0 either proves BD or disproves it. And so let's assume that it disproves it and I take some particular proof pi, right? And then I take that proof and I move it into one of these other first order theories of some non zero characteristic. Now, the proof that I gave earlier that BD holds inside the finite characteristic case crucially used the fact that. The, in the finite characteristic case, we're dealing with a finite field, which is a finite set of elements. So this pi, whatever the heck this proof is, 
it must not appeal to that, right? If it if it did, then it wouldn't be a valid proof inside this first order theory. So it's a little mysterious, and this is the reason why it works. So if I look at the earlier motivation that I gave, where I showed that the additive identity is unique inside rings, and then I um, generalized out to abelian groups, there I had a concrete proof, like the proof tree in question, it was actually written up in the previous lecture. So you can look at that thing written on the page and be like, right there is a goddamn proof tree that applies in this other first order theory. Whereas here, I'm really leaning on the tethering between the meta theory and the theory. I'm saying that I meta theoretically say there would be some proof pi, right? And I don't have a grip on that. And in fact, it's the fact that I don't have a grip on that which allows me to do to apply this proof technique non trivially. So I think that's really interesting. Okay, concluding what remains to prove is that these two first order theories are indeed complete. And to do that, I'm going to use general theory from first order logic. And this is going to require cardinality arguments and um, like elements from a second course in first order theory. So the Vosch Vought test and the compactness theorem and the upper and lower low and high Stollen theorems, etc. So that part is truly non trivial. And that comes next. And we're going to leave algebraic notions for a period to really get our hands dirty with first order theory. And then we're going to apply it to the situation and that will complete the proof. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Will. When you say, Questions. when you say cardinality will be involved, what do you mean? Like some non-trivial notions from set theory or you just mean like we'll have to use Zorn's lemma? Yeah, so a little bit. I will definitely have to use Zorn's lemma. I also need, for instance, the statement that for any infinite cardinality, there exists an algebraically closed field of that cardinality. Moreover, that algebraically closed field is unique up to unique isomorphism. Mm -hmm. The reason why that statement is relevant is because one of these first order theory tests, the Roche Fort test, uh, requires that all of your models have unique, um, essentially unique. Oh, sorry. Your first order theory has essentially unique infinite cardinality models. Uh, the reason why we need that is because we transport statements along those isomorphisms. So those isomorphisms preserve truth, right? And so we can use these contradictory arguments again in order to set up a criterion for when a first order theory is complete. So yeah, I'm going to use axiom and choice, but I'm also going to actually do some genuine cardinality arguments of particular models in order to set up a test <laughs> that can be used for completeness. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's super crazy, right? But I'm not, I'm not huge on it because I was having this discussion with Billy. There are moments when you start doing that kind of dodgy classical reasoning stuff in the meta theory. And that's the part that really upsets me. So you know how when you're learning first order theory, they teach you things like A implies B holds if say A is, um, what's the, what's the dodgy one? So, oh yeah, oh yeah, falsity, anything implying falsity is kind of true because false is always false. So that is kind of established inside first order theory and people complain about it because you say, how is that implication? I don't understand it. And then you say, whatever, it's just the way that we model it inside this particular notion of truth, you know, task in truth. This is how we think about implication. This is how we think about validity, etc. swallow it. And then you take that and you're kind of grumpy, but you accept it because it's one model of truth. But then when you discuss first order theories, you start using that argument, that argument style inside the meta theory as well. And it becomes really slippery. So I'm going to do that a lot. I'm going to start saying, grab a first order theory. It might have some inaccessible cardinality in size. And if it does, I can do this with it, etc. Mm, I don't really know how I feel about that just yet. 
are inaccessible cardinals genuinely going to come up in this argument? I don't know what an inaccessible cardinality is. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to consider up. I need to consider arbitrary. I need to consider a model of arbitrary infinite cardinality. Does that include inaccessible ones? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I think it does. But I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll leave the floor to other questions. Yeah. Anything else? For me. Cool. All right, we'll leave it there and I'll see you guys in a fortnight. Yeah, thanks, Will. Oh my god. What <laughs> is what a tree over. <laughs> that? It's an ent. <laughs> How are you doing that? <laughs> I'm a tree. <laughs> oh, that's. This is what I was working on earlier today. Oh, that was so worth it. I didn't know the right time to bring it out. Make there. me a tree. I need to be a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's so good. How do you do the drop tree? Oh, wow. So I can just... How do I, how do I pick up the tree? Can I just walk into a tree? Or is it just this tree? Yeah, it's, it's just this one for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Well done. I, I have a cool video of when I, I I forgot to make the bottom part of the tree not collidable. And uh, then this turned into a rocket because like <laughs> it was like under your feet. <laughs> it just <laughs> blasted off into the air. Anyway. Oh, awesome. Okay. Anyway, I, I'm really happy with this. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no relevance to the foundation. Well, that's great. That's exactly what we want. <laughs>